Yes, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Sounds okay. good. Okay, that's great. Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for this time of wonderful period that we can study your word, especially with the history. Right there you are always and that you keep your church alive. So Father and there, thank you for all the professors who are here for us to help our understanding. And uh, may your Holy Spirit illuminate our hearts and thoughts and mind so that we may be able to understand and apply it into our work and ministry and so that we may bring all the glory to, back to you. So we ask that your help during the study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Sidwa. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you all, the, all these who are participating here. Uh, I have um, mentioned, of course, to Dr. Arnold that I'm not that familiar with the technology, so he's going to be necessary to jump in now and then and help me if I get astray here. Uh, but I'll be trying to follow along with the material. Now, you'll notice that what's dominant here is my PowerPoint, and then I'm just in a kind of up in the corner, which is probably better on the whole. I, I like to use PowerPoint when lecturing uh, to give you the main points of my lecture, so you'll actually be able to follow along with my outline as I give it to you. Uh, point by point here. Now, what I'm going to be dealing with here is a concept that I call progressive illumination, which is not original with me. And I want to use it as a launching point to talk about, in a sense, kind of the interaction between scripture and history and how we come to it here. You know, I have a Bible right here. And the question is, how does what is in this Bible get to you or get to me? What is the historical process, if any, through which scripture comes to us? Now, actually, I even thought about this as early as high school. I remember when I came to college at Bob Jones University so long ago, uh, I had, as uh, Dr. Arnold mentioned, Dr. Edward Pinozian as a teacher, first of all, as an undergrad teacher, and then also in many of my graduate classes in church history. And Dr. Pinozian had a concept he called progressive illumination, which caught my attention, which I've gone back to and visited and revisited uh, many times. And so now you're in a sense, you're seeing the distillation uh, of all of this. Um, in fact, I forgot to ask Dr. Arnold, were they able to get the article, brief article that I wrote on this as part of the readings? Okay, so I can yes. look at that. Uh, that's, a, that's my first actual treatment of that done a number of years ago, and I've continued to work on and expand upon. You say, well, what is it? Well. Let me go through and explain where we're coming from, from, why it's kind of a question, and how Christians in the past have looked at these things. I want to start, first of all, by looking at the problem that we face. Basically this, how did Christian teaching get from the scriptures to us today? We have the Bible. We believe the Bible is the Word of God. It's inspired. How exactly does it come to us uh, some, well, you know, Revelation is perhaps the latest book written here, and that was some 2,000 years ago. And of course, you go back to the books of Moses, we're talking about 3,500 years ago. How do those things get to us? Uh, is it a succession of truth? In other words, is there some kind of uh, organization or something that is passing it along to us? Has somebody been a custodian or protector of the truth and has passed it down to us so that we have it today? Is there somehow you get around the process of history? In other words, well, history doesn't matter that somehow the scripture has come to us either by some kind of jump uh, from what it was in, say, the first century when the canon was closed to us today. Or is there some kind of growth or development involved? And of course, this is the concept I'm really going to be exploring this third one, but we're going to look at those first two as well, because we want to understand uh, why this is a question. In fact, this goes back to the Reformation. A common Catholic question was, where was your church before Luther? There's a story I like to use that we'll take as a part of our theme here by um, uh, about a man named Sir Henry Wotton. Now, Wotton was an English diplomat in the 17th century, the 1600s. Uh, and Wotton, as of course, was a Protestant being English, was assigned, though, to Rome. And once he went to a service 
uh, in Rome while he was there, not because he was Catholic, but because he wanted to hear the music. As he stood in the back listening to it, the priest who was officiating noticed him and recognized him as this English diplomat. And the priest actually wrote a note in the service and had it sent back to him. Where was your church to be found before Luther? And this is the question that comes up. It's particularly, of course, the Catholic idea. Well, uh, if you didn't come along till Martin Luther in 1517, nailing the 95 Theses, where were you all those centuries? Where was your faith? Where was your teaching here? And of course, Catholics have argued, uh, for the most part, for historical validity to their cause. In fact, we'll examine some of that as we go through the material this time. But even more specifically for us, not so much polemical, is just the puzzle that we face. And we look at church history, and you've done some in this class already, you may have done other reading, and you recognize that there are periods of history where it's very difficult to find some of the key teachings that we affirm. Now, justification by faith alone is a big one, because that's a Reformation, you know, central Reformation doctrine. We go back into the Middle Ages, uh, into the early church, uh, back into the post-New Testament era. We read the church fathers and the theologian, the history, and we sometimes say, this doesn't seem like what we are teaching. There's similarities. They believe in the Trinity. We believe in the Trinity. They believe in the resurrection of Christ. We believe in the resurrection of Christ. There's a lot of other doctrines we run into this problem. So the question is, how do we deal with that? How do we answer that? And this is a question that really informs our hermeneutics, our system of interpretation. Uh, as we think about how we interpret the Scripture, the, you know, one question is, does history play a role in that? How much of a role? Now, I'll say right up front this. History is not an authority. This is something my students have heard over and over, and I'm going to come back to that before we finish. History is not our authority. But, you know, Abraham Lincoln once said, uh, fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. And the fact is, that as Christians, we also can't escape it. We want to see how it fits in. Now, the first major portion here, I want to look at what I call some theories of historical theology. And what I'm talking about here are different ideas and concepts that Bible-believing Orthodox Christians have put forward. What I'm talking about here are not heretical viewpoints or liberal viewpoints. I'm talking about ways that Christians in history have tried to wrestle with history and try to understand, particularly from a doctrinal or a theological point of view, how history would, uh, can be understood. So I will look at here are four different ways uh, four different theories that people have put forward. Now, the first of them is this, direct individual illumination. In other words, a believer discerns the Bible's teaching directly through the illumination of the Holy Spirit. You sit down, you start reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit guides you, you read it, you understand it, you take away its truth. All right, that's the first one there. Now, as I look at these different theories, Let's go back to that question I talked about by Sir Henry Wotton. Where was your church before Luther? Okay, let's say that this is the view that you're putting forward. I got my truth directly from the Bible through history. So if somebody asked you, assuming you were the person who held this idea, where was your church before Luther? You would probably answer something like this. It's an irrelevant question. I have the truth now. Uh, exactly. Uh, where the church was, doesn't matter. I have the scripture. I have the Holy Spirit. He has given it to me. I know this as well. In other words, truth comes from scripture directly to the individual believer. Now, as I say this, you're probably thinking already, well, there's a lot of truth in that. In fact, on each of these views, even the ones I don't agree with, I want to mention to you that there are valid points. That's what I said. These are things that a Bible-believing conservative, orthodox, Protestant is going to affirm. Uh, and for example, this idea, there are basically theologically sound concepts in this idea. One is, of course, it's the objective authority of Scripture. You know, in a sense, you're saying right up front, uh, it's the Bible that's my authority, it's the Bible only that is my authority, uh, and that's what it's given to me. I don't have to have anything except this direct communication. And to add to that, it appeals to doctrines that we believe in. Uh, it's interesting, this evening, the uh, prayer that was began the session mentioned uh, for the Holy Spirit to illuminate us in this study. And of course, the illumination of the Spirit is a doctrine we believe in, and particularly 
as we look at the scripture and understand it. Uh, if you believe this approach, this viewpoint, you obviously believe the Holy Spirit does work illumination. It also has the idea of what you probably are familiar with, the perspicuity of Scripture. You know, it's the idea of the clearness of Scripture, the understandability of Scripture. The Bible is not an esoteric book. It's not a book of hidden symbols and uh, mysterious messages. Um, one of the classes I teach on the undergraduate level is the class in modern cults. And one of the things I encounter quite often in cults is what is referred to as an esoteric interpretation of the Bible. Somebody like the Christian science movement, which says, well, you have to have our system and understand our symbols and know our way of approaching these things. Then you will understand what the Bible says. But we say, no, it isn't. There are things hard to be understood in the Bible. There are things that we need to meditate upon in the Bible. But let's face it, the basic teaching and content of the Bible is understandable. Even the unsaved can usually understand what it's saying, even though they reject what it means. And of course, the priesthood of believers, that we have, don't have to worry on an interpretive authority, uh, that we can, as priests, come to God, come to his word. So what I'm saying is that this point, although I'm going to show you some shortcomings of it as a soul theory, is based on some pretty sound theology. The problem, however, is that it's historically naive. It ignores history. In other words, the problem with this viewpoint is that it's saying, well, history doesn't matter, and I have the truth regardless of how many centuries there are. Now, there's a truth to that, but think about this for a moment. How many of us, I mean, all of us, how many of us could actually say, well, I have gotten all my teaching and doctrine directly from the Scripture? And we'd say, well, no, we had teachers parents perhaps in some cases, uh, certainly others as well. Uh, but the fact is we have teaching uh, that is given to us, and our teachers had teachers, and those teachers had teachers too. The fact is there's been a long line of teaching and so on. And so simply to argue that all of our doctrinal understanding comes from our own reading of the Holy Scripture, uh, that doesn't really fit in with what the, what the data of history would tell us here. And it's not necessary, I think, as we're going to see here. So uh, this is certainly a possible viewpoint in terms of how we talk, think about Scripture, but it is something that really doesn't fit the whole of the data of history, and frankly is not within the experience of most of us as Christians. Now, second idea, what is called successionism. Now, the idea here is that there have been a succession of believers who have preserved true doctrine throughout history. In other words, and we'll talk about different forms of this in just a moment, but there's always been somebody as a relatively distinct body holding the teaching from the time of the New Testament on up to today who are teaching substantially what we teach uh, and preserving it in this way. Now, in other words, it's not just saying, well, there have always been Christians in history. Uh, I, you know, we would all affirm, and in fact, this is one of the points that we'll bring up here later, that there have always been Christians in history. There has never been an era where there was not uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, saved by grace through him. But what this seems to be arguing, there's a more organized group. In other words, it's almost like it's, it's visible to us. In fact, and put it this way, it's a visible trail of truth. We could go back into history, we, we could somehow go back in time and plop down in the middle of medieval France. We could look around, we might have to look a while, we might have to search a while, but we would find separate bodies of Christians holding to uh, the truth in some way and preserving it and passing it on. Now, let me just explain that term trail of truth for just a second. I mentioned to you I had Dr. Panosian for many of my classes, and another one of the phrases he liked to use was the trail of truth. And what he meant by that was going back through history to find the truth of Scripture, true believers and the, as, as well. Uh, and he would argue that, yes, there is one, but you would find it kind of inside and outside the institutional church, and it's not limited to particular organizations. But here, what we're saying is, if there's going to be a trail of truth, we've got to be able to see it, or at least potentially see it, even though some may be forced underground by persecution and so on. So, get to our question again. If you came to a successionist, 
and said, where was your church before Luther? He would say something like this. Well, it existed. It was persecuted quite often. At times, it was almost hidden from view. And in fact, he'd probably say some of the historical records have per perished since that time, but it was there, it was organized, it was functioning, and it was preserving the truth. In other words, the truth is preserved unchanging substantially in history. Uh, the things that we believe today were pretty much all held by somebody all through history, all the way back to uh, the New Testament. All right. Now, who teaches this sort of thing? What are some examples of successions? Well, let me just mention three of them, two of whom you sampled in the readings we provided for this lecture. First of all is John Fox. Now, Fox is probably a name that you know already, uh, popularly through his Fox's Book of Martyrs, as we often call it. Actually, that's not what he called it. Uh, his full title was The Acts and Monuments of the Christian Church. In fact, that's only about one-tenth of the title. The full title takes the complete title page. But it was a massive church history that he wrote during the Reformation. Uh, if, if you actually see the published work, it's in six volumes, uh, very hefty volumes as well. By the way, if you ever want to see Fox's work, it is available online. The complete Acts and Monuments has been put online. Uh, in fact, you just type in uh, John Fox Acts and Monuments online through Google or another search engine. You can probably pull it up and actually read not only uh, uh, that work, but actually in three different editions. But John Fox did this work, and then later it got abridged, abridged down to the, what we often think of as Fox's Book of Martyrs, in which he went and traced the story. And in fact, I gave you a brief excerpt from the early sections of his work uh, so you can get some idea of how he approached uh, this idea. So Fox is one, in fact, probably one of the big pioneers of this view in English, at least. He borrowed from some German uh, church historians and theologians informing this. Now, one you might have heard of, particularly because I know many of you are from Baptist background, is landmarkism. Now, landmarkism is the Baptist version of successionism. Now, let me just quickly say that this is no uh, particular criticism of, of Baptist. Every Protestant group every Protestant group pretty much has had some version of this. Uh, I've seen German Reformed versions, I've seen Methodist versions as well, but landmarkism had a, a pretty visible history among the Baptists, so I'm using it as an example. Landmarkists believe that John the Baptist was the first Baptist. He started the first Baptist church there in Judea in the first century, and Baptist churches have continued all through history from that time to the present, in an unbroken succession. Now, I don't know how common the idea is. I do know a couple of years ago, uh, I had a graduate student from the Philippines uh, who did his uh, semester project on landmarkism. And as he did his class presentation, he gave us a short video clip of an American landmarkist preaching in the Philippines, uh, advocating uh, his teaching as well. So you have landmarkism uh, as an example of this. And then you have Another example I gave you an excerpt from E.H. Broadbent, The Pilgrim Church. Now, Broadbent's a little bit different uh, in that he was uh, of the Plymouth Brethren. I don't know how familiar you are with this Plymouth Brethren being a group that began in England, spread to America, has gone worldwide, very strong on Bible prophecy, Bible teaching, very uh, low church kind of organization. Uh, but anyway, Broadbent was a historian who wrote this. And I remember I was introduced to this book first. Again, mentioning Dr. Panosian, one of my graduate classes uh, on the writing of church history, he took us, like four or five of us in the class, over to the library and started showing us some useful books in church history. And he pulled Broadbent's book off the shelf and said, this is the most sane trail of truth approach. And he meant by that it tried to trace these things, but Broadbent was not trying to argue, for example, there have been Plymouth Brethren all through history. He knew better than that. And he wasn't trying really to set it to a particular uh, theological tradition. He was basically saying there was a essential gospel teaching that went point to point. Now, I don't necessarily agree with Broadbent and all that he says and all of his conclusions, but he was trying to be much more uh, moderate, so to speak, in how he presented this. Now, let me say right here as we talk about this, there's a valid point, as I just mentioned in that the gates of hell never 
prevailed against the church of Jesus Christ. In every age, there have been those who have been saved by grace, who have been united to Christ through faith. And uh, where we find them, that's sometimes a historical challenge. But I do not deny at all that there have been genuine believers in Christ in every age uh, of all time. So, yes, that's an important point to keep in mind. However, a problem with this is it's difficult to support historically. They try to say, well, we will go, we will gather the evidence of history, and we will prove to you that this particular tradition, our particular group, has existed. And the fact is, you just can't do it. I have looked at these. I've read uh, different kinds of successionist approaches. Uh, and to be honest with you, there are holes in the information. There are big gaps in chronology. Uh, the sources are sometimes not the best here. The fact is, you really can't prove a continued existence from the historical data that we have. Now, some would point out, well, in fact, I remember reading one writer, uh, uh, Kenneth Good, I think was his name, we wrote on, uh, talking about our Baptist reform. Here are two, two books back in the 70s, I think it was our Baptist Calvinist and our Baptist reform. In the second of those books, he argued for a kind of landmark as Baptist landmark as position, but his argument was, well, the Bible teaches that there will always be churches like this in existence, therefore they must be in existence. Well, that's a theological, biblical argument, not a historical one. You can dispute that, uh, and we might still dispute that as well, but that would be basically how you'd come at this here. The fact is that gathering just the evidence of history is not uh, sufficient. Now, let me mention one more thing, too, before I leave successionism. The idea of apostolic succession, because some have made comparisons between these ideas here. The apostolic succession, you know, is what we think of as a Catholic idea. Now, some of you already say, wait a minute, it's not just Catholic. The Orthodox Church is Greek Orthodox. The Russian Orthodox believe in this. The Anglican Church and Episcopal Church in the United States, they believe in this. But we think of it classically as Catholic, so I'm just going to call it Catholic here. But the idea of apostolic succession is, well, how do you prove the church, and how do you prove its, you know, its guarantee of orthodoxy? Well, you trace a succession of ordination. Allegedly, all of the bishops, archbishops, cardinals, popes, uh, who are existent today were ordained by those who were ordained by those who were ordained by those going back, back, back until Jesus ordained his apostles, and his apostles ordained the first bishops and archbishops. In other words, there is a constant, unbroken line of ordination which grants an authority upon the church. And of course, as I say, this is classically a Catholic idea, uh, although used by other liturgical formal churches as well. In other words, they say, this is what proves that we are orthodox. It's what proves that we are true. Uh, in fact, I call it Catholic, really, before we have the establishment of the Catholic Church, we have this idea. If you go back to Eusebius, you may have heard of him, the father of church history, wrote the first um, comprehensive church history back in the fourth century, the time of Constantine. He basically taught apostolic succession, and he's basing it on some uh, patterns he sees even before his time. If you want to know that your church is true? Well, who is your bishop? And does your bishop trace back in proper succession here? Now, the point is here, and the difference between Catholic and these Protestant forms is that the Catholic form of succession, although it is a guarantee supposedly of orthodoxy, it basically vindicates the church. It shows you that the church has authority. The church is the true body. And of course, that means that you have to look to ultimately the Catholic church as the model. It is not itself the vindication of scripture, except the scriptures under the control and guidance of the church. Now, our third view, is called restorationism, or sometimes you'll hear it called primitivism. And I'll explain those two terms in a moment. The basic idea of restorationism is simply this. You want to restore the church to an earlier, primitive, purer age. In other words, you want to get back to the original. Uh, you think, for example, uh, I, I know people who restored cars. Well, what happens is you get a car that's pretty in bad shape and you and you fix it up, you repaint it, you somehow find the parts for it, and when you get done, you've made you know, maybe a, you know, a, a 67 Dodge Charger, 
which looks just like the original car when it came out here. You've restored it to that original model. Now, the term primitive has nothing to do with something being backward or crude. Primitive means original. Oh, well, for example, have you ever heard the story of the conversion of Charles Spurgeon? Maybe many of you have. Spurgeon, as a young man, was struggling with a sense of burden of sin. Uh, and he talked about how one Sunday he went out during a snowstorm trying to go to church. Uh, and he couldn't even make it to his normal church. So he turned in, as he said, to what he called a primitive Methodist chapel. Now, chapel is just a term in England for churches that weren't part of the Church of England. If you were an Anglican church, or a Baptist chapel, for example. But why did he call it a, and by the way, of course, you know the story, Spurgeon was converted there uh, through the preaching of uh, some Methodist elder who was there because the pastor couldn't make it. Um, but Spurgeon says a primitive Methodist chapel. So why did he call it that? Uh, you know, is it the fact that they had very, you know, rough benches? Uh, they didn't have indoor plumbing, uh, whatever it was. No, because those primitive Methodists claimed that they were recreating the original primitive New Testament church. Basically, restorationists are saying, we are bringing back the true New Testament church through our system. Okay, let's look at our question again. Where was your church before Luther, if you were a restorationist? Well, you would say something like this. It had fallen into error, waiting to be restored. Uh, some restorationists would still see traces of their belief going, looking back, but for the most part, they're going to say, you really don't have the full biblical truth until it is restored through our movement or church or group, as the case might be. Truth is actually lost for a time. It's in the scripture, but nobody sees it or knows it or takes it to heart. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples here. I've divided them up. This is not uh, a category that came with me from a different writer, but talk about two kinds of restorationism. First of all is the exclusive. I have here Joseph Smith. And if we were in a classroom, I would say, who knows who Joseph Smith was? And probably all of you would say, he's the guy that founded the Mormons. All right, that's a pretty good example here. Joseph Smith said that when he was a young man, he prayed, and he had a vision telling him, don't join any church, they're all wrong, and wait for the truth to be restored. And of course, Joseph Smith claimed that it was restored. He was given gold plates, which he translated into what we call the Book of Mormon. Uh, and of course, this tells the whole story of how Jews allegedly fled from uh, Palestine back in the days of the Chaldeans. They settled in North America, built a whole new civilization, which ultimately was destroyed sometime prior to the coming of Columbus. Okay, you know, this whole story of Mormonism. Okay, basically, Joseph Smith said that, you know, the truth was lost until I found those golden plates and gave them back to everyone. Uh, I call it exclusive because basically, you have to believe his claims and accept his system. Uh, Smith is saying, I am giving you the truth, and this is the only truth, and you have to follow this here if you're going to, if you're going to know it. Now, others have talked about an inclusive version. Um, an example here is Alexander Campbell, and I gave you a short selection from Campbell to illustrate this. Now, if you know the name of Campbell already, you're thinking of him, what we sometimes call the Stone Campbell churches, or sometimes, as opponents would say, the Campbellite churches, the churches of Christ, the Christian churches, the disciples of Christ. I don't know how much experience you've had with these groups, but they're all from the same tradition. Now, Campbell is sometimes called an inclusive restoration. What does he mean by that? Well, in other words, theoretically, he is not saying, well, you have to follow me and my beliefs and my system. He's simply announcing, I'm bringing forth a new approach, a new method, which if everybody follows this, they'll be able to get back to the original New Testament church again. Now, some of you quickly say, well, wait a minute, I, I don't know, again, what your background is, but if you had an encounter with some of the churches of Christ, for example, you know that they sound very exclusive sometimes, that we are the only body. And you have to be baptized by immersion for salvation if you want to go to heaven. And so it was kind of a sectarian streak. There's actually liberal uh, adherence of the Campbell tradition who are actually very ecumenical because they say, oh, we want to get all the churches together. We want to reunite them. But basically the point is this, whether you're talking about Joseph Smith saying it's my system, which is the truth, or it's Alexander Campbell saying, no, I've got a new, fresh approach here. The idea is the truth was lost and we have brought it back. 
Now, an idea that is sometimes tied with the, the, with the restorationism is what's called the fall of the church, or some might call it the great apostasy. I mean, obviously, you know, I mentioned restoring a car. You don't get, if you were to find a car that had been preserved in a museum for 50 years, you wouldn't have to take it out and restore it. It would still be in pristine condition. What you need to do is to find uh, a car that needs to be restoring. Well, obviously, if you're going to restore the church, the church had to go astray someplace. And so they have this idea or concept of the fall of the church attached to that here. Uh, the church fell into serious error at some point. Well, when and where? Well, there have been different ideas in history. Uh, one which was very big among the reformers, and even today among some traditions, was the papacy. That in the Middle Ages, as the popes continued to gather power to themselves, as they continued to build up the position of the Bishop of Rome, as they extended the spiritual and even political reach that uh, this evil alliance that the popes had put together brought about the establishment of the papacy, which therefore caused the church to fall into error. Now, another idea which has been uh, popular is that what goes back to Constantine. Uh, the Emperor Constantine, if you remember your church history, uh, was the man, the emperor, who converted to Christianity, at least nominally. Uh, he gave legal toleration to Christians. Uh, he began to give money to the church to support itself, allow the construction of new churches, and so on. And about a generation after Constantine, one of his uh, grandsons or great-grandsons made Christianity the state religion of the Roman Empire. Well, there have been a lot of Christians who said that's where the church fell. When Constantine made it, you know, brought everybody into the church, which he didn't actually do, but he encouraged the movement of all Romans into the church. And then later on, with his successors, made Christianity the state religion, that created an evil church-state alliance. And that church-state alliance has corrupted the, the whole church. And so we look back to the root of our problems being with Constantine, as I say, the Anabaptists during the Reformation would often advocate this idea because the Anabaptists were very opposed to this union of church and state. A lot of modern Protestants, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if you've heard some variant on this before, because again, there's some element of truth to that. Uh, Constantine did help promote the inclusion of unregenerate masses into the church. But this would be an example here as well. Now, let me mention one thing here before I go on to one of the articles I said you, I, had, I gave you to read if you've gone through was the article I wrote on progressive illumination. Now, I did that, oh, what, 25 years ago, I think at least, it's been a number of years. Um, and that's actually my first time I tried to write this out and state this. And in fact, in there, if you might even remember, I actually said, I, I wonder if the fall of the church might be dated back to the end of the apostolic era. Well, I'd have to say that nowadays, I don't think I would say that. Uh, that uh, the process of development we're going to talk about is something that would actually begin from that point, that there really wasn't a fall. But I did kind of in, imply in that earlier article that I was thinking along those lines. Now, are there valid points to this restorationist view? Well, yeah, and, but they're more practical, I think, in this case than theological. One is that reform usually involves an element of restoration. Uh, Normally, whenever you're trying to fix something that has gone wrong, you're going to try to get it back to what it was before to some extent in some way. Uh, anyway, Martin Luther, I wouldn't call him a restorationist, but he was looking back to say, can I get back to some of the things that Paul was teaching here, which have been obscured through all of these, these centuries as well. And I'd say this, that restoration is a practical possibility. You know, I look at some of these movements, and some of these movements are better than others uh, when it comes to atomic restoration. I would say, well, you know, there, there's been some good of this. If I can just quickly uh, give you an example here. I mentioned the Plymouth Brethren. Now, I gave you that selection from um, uh, Broadbent, which is a Plymouth Brethren kind of successionist approach, but many of the Plymouth Brethren have tend to be restorationists. They said, oh, well, we're trying to get back to the New Testament church. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the Plymouth Brethren, but we really don't have major arguments with them. Uh, you know, I don't know, maybe someone here might even come from Plymouth Brethren background. Uh, they're usually strongly uh, premillennial congregational organizations, strong on the authority of the Bible and so on. So I look at them and say, well, there's a lot of good things that came out of that as well. Uh, what I'm going to argue here, though, is you're trying to explain all of history. 
and you're trying to explain how that scripture gets to us today, which is what we're focusing on, uh, we have a practical possibility of getting back, but it's not something that's set down as this is the way things should be. And in fact, there are some problems. One is, it really does seem to remove God's presence from history. You know, one of the things that I believe as a Christian historian and try to teach is that God is at work in history. God is present. Uh, I remember once doing a paper a few years ago on Jonathan Edwards and, uh, and his work, The History of the Work of Redemption. And Edwards' whole point is that God is always at work through history. In fact, it's rather interesting getting on a small rabbit trail for a second. Rabbit trail, by the way, I'm using that term. Those from Bob Jones University know that the founder used to talk about rabbit trails, where you, where you have a certain kind of dog that hunts possum. You don't want to go around chasing after rabbits instead. Well, rabbit trail, I'll get off for just a second here. But um, I, I remember reading, you know, that Jonathan Edwards uh, was uh, writing, his work was during the 18th century of the Enlightenment. And in the Enlightenment, you have people like Edward Gibbon, who wrote the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, who tried to explain Christianity naturally, naturalistically. Uh, there is no supernatural explanation of Christianity. It's the result of natural forces. And that's what most the tendency of most Enlightenment historians. Jonathan Edwards was a counterpoint to that. I don't know if he thought about this, particularly when he wrote it. In fact, I don't know he would have been familiar with Gibbon. But the fact is that Edwards said, well, God is always involved in history, and God is, in fact, intervening in history. He saw the Great Awakening as one of God's interventions in history. So I had the problem if you try to take God out and just like, well, the truth just lapsed for a time until somebody came along to bring it back. It fundamentally bypasses history. Um, really, you know, when I was trying to work on this before, you don't find examples of restorationist historians very much. Oh, you can find people like Campbell who wrote about the need for a restoration of some kind, but you really can't write about the history of the church because, well, for a long time, the church was just kind of in eclipse, uh, essentially. Uh, and of course, that's one of the things that the Mormonism said. I mean, basically, Mormonism says until Joseph Smith came along. You know, just quickly, if you don't know Mormon teaching, is that, uh, you know, we had all this settlement in the New World, uh, this whole civilization supposed existed in North America way back at the time of Christ, and that allegedly after his passion, Jesus actually appeared in North America and gave the gospel, presented the gospel to the people there so that they had it too. Uh, and that's how the, the, he explains all this. You know, well, the problem, of course, if you're a Mormon is, well, you know, if Joseph Smith didn't come around until 18-whatever, uh, what about all those people before Joseph Smith? Uh, how are they going to have the truth? Well, Mormons get around this through their baptismal doctrine. You can be baptized for your ancestors, and then your ancestors have the opportunity in the afterlife to choose Mormonism at that point, so they can get around it that way. But the fact is that most of these restorationist viewpoints kind of now, downplays history, to say the least. And also, can I just mention this diversity of restorationist agendas? What do I mean? Okay, the Mormons are restorationists. Uh, the Stone Campbell are restorationists. The Plymouth Brethren, in some ways, at least classically, are restorationists. But they don't all teach the same thing. You know, I mentioned the primitive Methodist in England. They were a group said that we are bringing back uh, the primitive New Testament original gospel here. You may know, some of you may know that in America, at least, there's a group called the Primitive Baptists. And the Primitive Baptists say, we are bringing back the original New Testament teaching. Yet the Primitive Baptists are a very staunchly Calvinistic group. Some even label them hyper-Calvinistic in some circles. And of course, the Primitive Methodists were staunchly Arminian. The fact is that all these different restorationists are saying, here's what the restored truth looks like, and they don't look the same. Uh, which, which restored truth is true? Which restored truth do you follow? Do you follow Joseph Smith? Do you follow Alexander Campbell? You, okay, you get the idea at this point. So you have this whole problem or challenge in that way. Okay, now I'm coming to one that, where I'm going to be dealing with and expanding upon, but I want to get it in the context here compared to these others, a developmental view of how we come to the truth. In other words, the data of history seem to point to some kind of development in history. As we look over history, it seems like, well, wow, ideas seem to develop and come to us 
sometimes almost by steps. And he might already be feeling a little uneasy as I say that, so bear with me here. Now, let me just insert something here. This is one of my little mini lectures I give my history students. This is probably the only time I'll speak to you folks. I'll give it to you here. Uh, scripture is our authority. History is not our authority. Scripture deals with certainties. History deals with likelihoods and probabilities. You can't come to, now understand, there are certain things about Christianity that are based on history and are certain. Uh, there's a motto of a 16th century uh, Protestant church historian which says essentially uh, the foundation of theology is history. And there's a certain truth to that. Jesus Christ actually lived. He actually died on a cross. He actually arose from the dead, came up, he actually went back to heaven. There are historical truths. Christianity is a historical religion. But the fact is that the data of history for us is often consists of things that are outside of Scripture. I mean, you know, um, we think it's very likely that this happened according to the data that we have. But this is July. All right, we just uh, had uh, Independence Day in America. Uh, we're close here to the anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg in the American Civil War. Now, if I said the, American, the Battle of Gettysburg occurred in July of 1863, you say, well, yeah, that happened in history. In fact, we said that's almost certain. I mean, this just got a great likelihood that that happened. And there's really no reason to dispute. But on the other hand, let's start saying, well, why is it that the Confederacy lost the Battle of Gettysburg or the Union won it? What mistakes did Robert E. Lee make? Or how did Lee's subordinates not carry out his orders? Or whatever else you want to bring in here. The fact is, the more you get into the details, it's more like, well, it seems likely or it's quite possible that, and that's what we deal with in history. History doesn't have the same certainty. There are historical truths about Christianity that are foundational. That's what we call the gospel. But the fact is that the data of history itself, outside of the scripturally uh, communicated information, is a little more uh, confusing, which is the reason we're having this lecture in the first place. All right, so I said the data seems to point to some kind of development. Now, here's one of the reasons that it does sound suspicious. If you read a lot of church history, and the fact is that most church history is written by people who are more liberal theologically, sometimes who are just secular writers writing about history. You know, you can find conservative commentaries on any book of the Bible. You can find conservative systematic theologies and other works as well, and probably you're familiar with some of these. Church history, you're gonna have a, more of a tendency to run into liberal ideas. And the fact is a lot of liberal church history just talks about their development of Christianity. Well, they didn't believe this back in the days of the New Testament, but Martin Luther invented this, or so-and-so developed that. Uh, and, you know, at that point, you start saying, well, that's pretty much a threat to the gospel. Well, what I want to stress to you is that although there are liberal developmental approaches, they don't have to be liberal. And I'm going to hopefully show you here uh, an alternative. I'd like to use an imagery that comes from uh, history, dwarves on the shoulders of giants. Now, if you read the little article that I wrote on this, I actually quoted this famous account. It's been come from different places, but the version I use is from the Middle Ages. Uh, John of Salisbury, who was an unimportant medieval writer, was talking about someone named Bernard of Chartres. And he said, Bernard of Chartres used to say that we are like dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants so that we are able to see more and further, certainly not because of our sharp vision or the height of our bodies, but because we are transported and lifted up by their gigantic size. I mean, you understand, if a dwarf, a midget, stands on the shoulders of a giant, the midget can actually see farther than the giant does because he's up his head, his eyes are above those of the giant. But you recognize that, well, it's because we have the giant there in the first place that allows us to see. What I want us to talk, see here is that each generation of Christians stands on the shoulders of those who went before. And we're able to see more, not because we're so great, or because we're so talented, or we have such a keener intellect, but because we can take what they have done and what they have seen, and we can begin to take that as our basis and build upon it. And I think this is an imagery that kind of communicates where I'm coming from here. Now, let's look at our question again. Where was your church before Luther? Well, if you're developmental, and I'm talking about a biblical 
Bible-based authority here would be in the Bible. You remember I mentioned Sir Henry Wotton and that British diplomat I talked about in the 1600s. Now he went to that service in Rome and the priest sending the message, where was your church to be found before Luther? You know what Sir Henry Wotton did? He took it and wrote on the bottom and sent back to the priest, my church was to be found then where yours is not to be found now in the scripture. Uh, and of course, we think that that is, a, is a, an appropriate response. Protestantism's strength is its appeal to the Bible, not to history. But you might say, wait a minute, aren't you back down to that original thing? You know, it's me and the Bible. I get it right from the Bible. No, our religions found the Bible, but we see the truth in full, unfolds in history. And this is what we think of as kind of the developmental idea that I'm going to talk about as we go along here. Now, the problem is this. We believe in the Bible. We believe the scripture is holy, inerrant, authoritative. We do not believe the Bible changes. We don't believe that there is new truth. How do you do that and stick, then have a developmental approach to history and a developmental to how we state and understand our theological systems? That's what I want to present to us here. I refer to this as progressive illumination. As I mentioned, this is a term that I received from Dr. Panosian that I've used and built upon and expanded upon. I guess you'd say I'm standing on the shoulders of Dr. Panosian uh, as I give you this as well. Uh, let me explain what I mean by it, but let me say this right up front. Because I'm going to make the point later, this is a theory, an explanation I am suggesting to you. I am not going to try and claim this is the truth and you should all follow me. I want to submit this for your consideration. Think about this. See whether this actually does help to us to understand and explain and approach history. Now, let me give a definition. And this, I usually try to keep my, all my um, PowerPoint slides brief. You know, I want just a couple of words if I can, a phrase at most. But this one, I have to get something a little bit longer because it is my full definition of what I'm talking about. Progressive illumination, by that I mean development through time of the church's subjective understanding of God's objective truth revealed in Scripture. Now, there's two elements there to keep in mind. God's word is the objective revealed truth. The change or development is not in that truth. It's in our subjective understanding and comprehension of it. Now, that's what I'm going to be dealing with here and then in the next few minutes as we go through this. Now, understand the term here is a, it's a play. Dr. Panosi think of play on the term progressive revelation, but this is not the same thing. You're familiar probably with the term progressive revelation already. There's a legitimate sense we use that, you know, that if you look at the Old Testament, that things are sometimes in, in the New Testament, that some truths of Scripture are revealed more and more as time goes on. That is, uh, we have, you know, the, the hints of the gospel in Genesis chapter 3 uh, with the, the uh, son of man who is going to crush the serpent's head. But we don't have the full explication and explanation of the gospel until the New Testament era. Uh, that's the idea that the, in the Bible you may find it. Now, sometimes that term is used, though, well, you think of the Mormons again, that we have new revelation since the Bible. And of course, this we reject entirely. There is no revelation uh, beyond that in that way here. Um, you know, the first time I actually taught this in a lecture a number of years ago, uh, the Sunday before I was to, to lecture on, I was sitting in church, and we sang the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. And I came across, and I really noticed the words in that hymn, what more can he say than to you he hath said, of course, referring to the Bible. What more can God say to us? He's given us all that we need for salvation and all that we need for Christian living. That's the idea of 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17. Paul told Timothy, the Bible gives you, makes you wise into salvation. The Bible furnishes you thoroughly uh, to every good work. So we say the Bible is complete. God doesn't say anymore to us. And so what we're not talking about here of something new or a new message or a new revelation from God. And as I said, the fall of the church, I would suggest, never occurred. And this is, again, something I have to kind of work through 
you know, the question is, well, how did the church get so far into error in the Middle Ages, for example, or even in the early church? Uh, and those are questions you wrestle with. I won't really have time to try to deal with at this point. Simply to say that what we've talked about is how God has been working in the church throughout history since he gave us the scripture uh, in our understanding of it. It is development, yes, but it's within the confines of scripture. You still cannot go beyond the Bible. Uh, whatever understanding we think that we have developed it is still tested by and limited by the Word of God. And I'll come back more to that thought as we go through this uh, as well. Um, we are insisting upon the Reformation truth of sola scriptura. The scripture alone is our authority. Um, and that's really a first and foremost principle here. In fact, I said to you that this idea of progressive illumination is my suggestion or thought for you to consider. The sola scriptura is not something for you to consider, but for a truth that we need to accept. And I want to lay a stress upon that. I make a parallel here to the idea of sanctification, that we grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that, that's the experience of all of us. Uh, you know, I don't know how long you have been a Christian. Uh, I just turned 60 this year, which is definitely a marker. Uh, and so that makes it, uh, well, 50 years, I guess, next month uh, since I uh, professed conversion a vacation Bible school service back in Indiana, where I grew up. Uh, you know, I have learned a lot in 50 years. I certainly have a long ways to go. I certainly have a lot more to know. But the fact is, I know a lot more and understand a lot more than I did when I was 10 years old. I understand something about what it means to grow in grace. And I want us to see that that possibility is there for the history of the church as well. I'll give you a quotation from Billy Sunby, a famous uh, American evangelist of the 20th century. He made a point I thought was interesting. Sunday said, theology bears the same relation to Christianity that botany does to flowers. Botany is rewritten, but the flowers remain the same. Theology changes, but Christianity abides. Yeah, flowers don't change. Flowers are flowers. But what scientists write about flowers may shift and change and alter as scientists study those flowers. And the same with us. Uh, theology, and somebody here meant theology as humans try to talk, take and explain the Word of God. Theology might change, but the Word of God doesn't. That's the idea that we're striking here. So this is the concept I want to lay out now. I've given you the basics. I kind of want you to see now some of the ramifications of this and applications of it as we go through. All right. Therefore, I want to turn from theories of development to theorists of development. I want to talk about three people who have advocated a form of development in history. Uh, we're going to see that uh, one, I think, is insufficient for reasons I will give. The second, I'm going to say, is flat out wrong, but I want you to understand him because he's going to give a view of, of development that you may encounter. And third is an illustration of someone who's talking about what I'm talking about here. All right, let's start here with Yaroslav Pelikan. Now, you may or may not be familiar with Pelikan. Can I, can I jump in to interrupt? It's your, um, totally your decision. Somewhere maybe in the next 10 or 15 minutes, we could take a five minute break. That's um, fine. So, so anyway, I'll leave that at your discretion when you think that's a good time. Well, I'll and, tell you what. Uh, Why don't we do it right next time? Since I'm right between points right now, Let's go ahead and take a break. Um, what do you say, 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, five minutes. We'll just take five minutes. Okay. Well, I've got you know, in Eastern Standard Time, the U.S. is one till nine. So about five after nine, I'll start over again. Is that okay? Sounds okay. perfect. Great. All right. okay. Good. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. Thank you. Looking forward That's to the fine. next I hour. I to ask if we had needed to take a break to begin with. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank you. One thing here, maybe before we get into the flow here, uh, one person was asking here, <laughs> and you can just uh, um, see how this strikes you. Is the idea of progressive illumination a personal theory? Um, it is personal in the fact it's my statement of it. Uh, I'd have to say it is an idea I have gotten from others. Uh, I mentioned Dr. Panosian particularly, and you're going to see 
and the examples I use, how others have given a similar idea. So this is my own personal statement and summary, but it is based on ideas I've gotten from others uh, and also uh, that I have read in others as well. So it's a kind of a pulling together of thoughts and concepts here. Great, thank you. Sure, are there any other questions? I, I don't seem to see the questions here. So if you need to stop and, and uh, have me answer a question, I'll be glad to do so if you let me know. Okay. I think we're just, we're just cruising along and uh, at least I'm just trying to get things down so we don't have time to come up with questions. That's good, it's all good. Yeah, right now, no time to have questions. I talk very fast too. I bet you haven't noticed that. Uh, there's been comment on the fact that uh, I, I definitely do not have a Southern drawl. Of course, I'm from Indiana, not the South originally anyway. All right, uh, we are at the halfway point here, so this was a good place for a break. I said I want to talk about some theorists of development, and I want to start with Yaroslav Pelikan. Now, you may or may not have heard of him. If you study church history, you would have come across his name. Uh, he was professor of church history at Yale for many years. He's dead now. But he was certainly an extremely well-known church historian. Uh, if you ever study the history of creeds, for example, he and one of his research assistants did what is probably the standard volume on this. It's a rather expensive reference work, but it goes into and shows you just about every major creed in history. Uh, it's supplanted Schaff's old creeds of Christendom, for example. Um, and in fact, I gave you an article by him uh, published in the journal Church History in the mid-1960s, when he talks about the idea of development and history. In fact, that article was the first step in what became a multi-year project by Pelican. Uh, he wrote a um, five-volume history of the development of doctrine, which fits right in with our discussion here. So we want to see how he fits into the story. Now, in that article and then in the, in the five volumes, in fact, I was going to show you one of the volumes, but I thought, well, even if I held it up, you couldn't see much about it. But, you know, there are five rather significant volumes on the history from the close of the New Testament to the present. He discussed the development of Christian tradition, not so much as we would put it, the development of biblical doctrine. Now, it's an important distinction to keep in mind. Uh, to give you a quotation of the definition from Pelican, uh, he said that, what the Church of Jesus Christ believes, teaches, and confesses on the basis of the Word of God, this is Christian doctrine. Now, that's a true point. The problem with Pelican, from our point of view, is this, is he does not connect the doctrinal content of Scripture to church tradition. He starts at the year 100, and he traces the development of Christian doctrine through their appeal up to the scripture and to whatever other, other sources. Of course, Catholics would have various tradition and so on as well they would appeal to. But he doesn't actually try and say that the Christian tradition necessarily connects to the scripture. He's saying this is what people say and think uh, based on how they understand the scripture. Of course, this to us is, is, is missing the main point. Uh, we want to know how is it that how we believe and state and understand our faith is connected to what God said in the Scripture. And Pelican doesn't deny that part. He just doesn't really deal with that part. By the way, an interesting footnote, Pelican was a lifelong Lutheran. Uh, and then at the close of his life, uh, he converted to the Orthodox Church. I don't know if it's Greek Orthodox or which of those that he joined which kind of shows how he went into the idea of tradition even more uh, in his later, latter years there. So Pelican's an interesting illustration, and you may come across his name if you ever try to study this, this topic out for yourself, or you may come across some of his helpful and significant works. But let's go now to one who is more controversial, but older. John Henry Newman, or as he's often known, John Henry Cardinal Newman. Now, Newman, began as an Anglican. He was a member of the Church of England. And in fact, in his early years, he was a very strong evangelical for a time. But as time went on, uh, he went from being a strong evangelical to being what is referred to in Anglican circles as very high church. The high church means you're into more of the formalism, more of the liturgy. Uh, usually, we often see a resemblance there to Roman Catholicism. In fact, Newman became the major leader of what was called the Oxford Movement in the Church of England. 
And the Oxford movement uh, was all about uh, trying to make the Church of England more like the Catholic Church. In fact, it's sometimes called the Anglo-Catholic movement. And in fact, as you see by the PowerPoint, Newman himself later left the Church of England and was made a cardinal of the Catholic Church. Now, what are the ideas of Newman in terms of Christian development, doctrinal development, and importance? Well, he wrote a famous essay on development. Uh, in fact, you can find this online. The book is in public domain. Uh, I thought about giving you a selection from him to read, but as I went through and looked at it, I couldn't find, you know, all I wanted was a few pages that summarized his approach very conveniently, and I really couldn't find anything. So instead, I gave you the article on the internet uh, from Our Sunday Visitor, where a Catholic writer was describing his views in part. It's a pretty helpful introduction. But anyway, what are Newman's ideas? Well, Newman believed that historical research vindicated Catholic claims. Now, let me quickly explain what I mean by that. Newman himself was a historian. That is, that he actually researched and wrote and published some works of history while he was a leader in the, in the Church of England as well. Now, you have to understand, particularly among high church Anglicans, they like to say, well, if you go back in history, say to the 100s and the 200s and the 300s, if you go back in history, you won't find the Catholic Church. And they said, and you won't find evangelical Protestant Christianity. High Church Anglicans say, if you go back into the early church, you'll find High Church Anglicanism, essentially here. Well, Newman was doing research, and he was checking these things out. And he concluded, you know, as I look at history here, I don't think this is an uh, example of uh, high church Anglicanism, this looks pretty Catholic to me. In fact, you may even come across this uh, quotation from Newman. To be deep in history is to cease to be a Protestant. Newman believed, well, you've heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome. Well, Newman said all historical load, roads lead you to the Roman church. Uh, if you study history and look at history and follow what history reveals, you will abandon the Protestant position, as he ultimately did, uh, and you will then gravitate to the Roman Catholic position. Now, by the way, one insert here, what do we think about this? Well, let me just give you the reply that I have given in classrooms year after year. When I quote uh, Newman on this point, I say, to be deep in Scripture is to cease to be a Roman Catholic. And really here, I'm laying out again the principle that I gave you at the beginning of this lecture. Um, our authority is scripture. If your authority is history, you might well be led to Catholicism. But if your authority is scripture, you will be led away from Catholicism to the Protestant evangelical Christian faith. And so these are the points that, anyway, that he brings out here, this historical research, as I said. Now, Newman, however, when he looked at history, did not try and argue that the Catholic Church had, contained, had continued unchanging through history. Uh, he said, well, no, that, that obviously isn't true. He said there has been development. And there's an illustration of this. You'll often hear with him, you notice I say here, the acorn and the oak. Now, I have to tell you that although this is often associated with Newman, uh, in fact, even the article I had you read online, that author quoted this our acorn and oak story as though it, Newman gave it. Apparently, it doesn't come from him. I tried to track it down. I could not find that the word acorn didn't occur in his book on development anywhere, at least as I searched it on Google. Uh, and also that uh, I don't that it's been credited to other authors. But here's the idea. You take an acorn, you plant it in the earth, give it enough time, and it grows into an oak tree. Now, obviously, an oak tree does not look like an acorn, although you do have a lot of acorns on it. But nobody questions or doubts that that acorn, that seed, grew up into a full-grown oak. Uh, it developed the oak, can I put this way, developed from the acorn, even though the change in resemblance and size has changed dramatically. This is what Newman was saying. Well, of course there's development, and of course, you know, the early church may not look exactly like the Catholic church of the 19th century, to which Newman belonged, but it's still in con continuous unity with that church. It grew out of that. Now, 
one of the problems you have if you're studying church history, Newman faced this, and we face this too, well, how do you decide what's a development and what's a corruption? I mean, all of us would admit there has been corruption in church history. I mean, I mentioned to you, I teach cults. I mean, cults is a whole class where we talk about various corruptions in church history, false teachings about Christ, about the Trinity, about salvation, about the Word of God, uh, you know, all of these things. Well, the problem is when you study history, and, you, and if you study history with a strong commitment, whether it's a Catholic commitment like Newman had, or it's a biblical Protestant commitment like we have, all right, how do you tell a development from a corruption? Well, Newman in his book came up with seven different guidelines. Now, it's kind of interesting. You notice I call it tests or notes. The first volume of this, the first time he published this work on development, he was still an Anglican. He called them tests then. But after he became a Catholic cardinal, he republished the work, revised it somewhat, and he changed tests to notes. And I think we'll see why as we go through here as we talk about his view of authority. But he said, well, you can look at certain things. And the article that you read online, if you had a chance to look at that, talks about the seven tests, you know, uh, is it consistent with what went before and all these other things you can look at. And these will kind of guide you to whether what we have here is truly a development of the truth from the acorn of Christianity, or whether it's a corruption, which therefore we should turn our backs on. Now, this raises the question then, of course, for Newman, what is his authority? And Newman is not uh, ashamed to say that he needed an infallible developing authority, somebody to tell you that this is really a development and this is not a corruption. He is someone to judge uh, whether these things are right or wrong, whether they're valid or invalid. And he said, I believe I can find this in the doctrine of the infallibility of the church. In other words, the fact that the Catholic Church has been given by God, he said, to guarantee our orthodoxy, uh, to maintain the truth of the church. In other words, he, he came to unite, in a sense, his idea of development with the traditional idea of apostolic succession. And, of course, this is one of the points that we really see as a difficulty with others as well, as I'm going to touch on here in just a moment. But this is where Newman is coming from. Uh, and, frankly, a lot of people... If you study this, uh, if you ever start reading works on development, there's some point they're going to wrestle with Newman. That's the reason I've taken so much time with him. I mean, to a certain extent, he's a little passe for us. It's been about 150 years or so since he died. And probably most of you have never read his work, although, as I say, you can still get it, read it if you like. Um, but the fact is um, that he is still part of the discussion and the debate over the idea of development. And so he's really one of the major theorists as we think about this concept. Now, rather than answer Newman directly, though, I want to give you a third theorist, a man named William Cunningham, who was a theologian, teacher of theology, a professor as well as minister of the Free Church of Scotland. Now, it might be some of you may have seen William Cunningham's name before. Uh, Banner of Truth, for example, has reprinted some of his significant works, his works on historical theology and the theology of the Re Reformers, for example. Uh, the Free Church of Scotland broke from the State Church of Scotland in the middle of the 19th century over a number of issues. Theological liberalism was one of them, although government interference in the church was probably a bigger issue. And the Free Church then had to start its own churches, its own school, and Cunningham became their major professor of historical theology. Now, I use Cunningham here, well, first of all, because he responded to John Henry Newman. What I'm going to present to you from him actually is from a book review that William Cunningham wrote about Newman's essay on Christian development, on the development of doctrine. Uh, and the fact is that when I say book review, you, maybe you think like, you know, I've written book reviews, two, three pages on something. Well, this was like a 30-page review on Newman. In fact, it's, it's later republished in one of the collections of Newman's writing. The Banner of Truth has republished that one because it's more, a little more specialized. But in that, Cunningham took on Newman's ideas and concepts. And what did he say? Well, from our point of view, and you, could, you can read more of Cunningham if you'd like, I'm just going to bring out two elements here. First of all, he stressed the idea that what we are talking about, if we try to see a view, view of development, is a subjective understanding 
of objective truth. The very point that I gave you in the definition is what Cunningham stressed. This is one of those things, you know, when you're, when you're studying history uh, and you're working through something and you come to an idea or a concept and you kind of find, your, you know, you, way, you don't look for other writers like people look for church fathers, but when you find somebody a hundred years before you were born writing the same idea that you've come up with, I think you've come up with, it's kind of like, oh, this is pretty neat here. Because really, he goes through and says, well, you know, yes, there is some development, but that's the, the idea that we understand more of what God has given, the very point that I'm making. In other words, he stressed the normative authority of Scripture here. Now, that's important. He said that the problem with, uh, well, actually, there's twofold problem with Newman. One, I've already mentioned it, relies upon the church as its authority. But he even pointed out that beyond that, that in a sense, uh, Newman, if you take his seven guidelines, his seven tests or notes, you have kind of a rational basis here. I mean, you look at these things and say, well, this doctrine, according to my seven tests, seems to be a corruption, therefore I reject it. Or this doctrine or practice, according to my seven tests, seems to be a valid continuation, so I accept it. And he said basically that itself is kind of a subjective rationalism. I mean, Newman, or excuse me, Cunningham said, I could take those seven guidelines of Newman, and I could show you that what Newman says is a corruption is actually a development, and what Newman says is a development is actually a corruption. But he says that's irrelevant. What matters is not what I do or what Newman does, Cunningham says. What matters is what does the scripture say about it here as well. Now, it's interesting. We actually can see something of Cunningham doing this. Of course, Cunningham was a Presbyterian, Free Church of Scotland, uh, and he actually, in a sense, showed, gave an example of this in his development of Calvinism, that he sees Calvinism itself as a developmental uh, growth through history, uh, the idea of ideas being understood, organized, so on. Now, it's interesting, as the writer, one writer points out, uh, Cunningham, however, kind of stops with the Westminster Confession, which, of course, was 200 years before he uh, was teaching. Uh, it's kind of like he was willing to think about development, but once you got to the Westminster Confession in the 1600s, it's almost like development sort of stopped. Uh, he didn't see much changing or going on from that time forward, which kind of, I think, illustrates to us some of the challenges we face uh, with this, as you'll see as we talk about it. So, Pelican, Newman, Cunningham, these are all men who have wrestled with, in some sense, this question of development. And I think Cunningham comes down to the best illustration of what I'm talking about here. All right, now let's change, shift a little bit to some qualifications and considerations of what we've been saying, what we've been dealing with here as well. Now, I want to give what I first of all call some scriptural considerations. Uh, now, notice I say considerations. I didn't say proof texts. As I tried to uh, stress here, this is a formulation that I am suggesting that helps us to approach and understand church history. I think it is indicated in the teaching of Scripture, but I'm not trying to argue that, well, my position is the scriptural one, whereas everybody else is wrong. As I said, this is something, I, I want to stress this, this is something I want you to take to think about, to muse over, and you may end up with something else. You may disagree with me, or you might agree with me on a lot of things, but modify some points. But here are some things from Scripture that kind of point to what I'm talking about. Here's one, in fact, I mentioned already. 2 Peter 3, 18, uh, to give you the full passage, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory now, both now and forever. Amen. All right to grow in grace. Now, as I mentioned, of course, we think about that in terms of our own sanctification without any question. We all know that individually, we have increased in our subjective understanding of the objective truth of God's Word. Now, the question is, well, does that translate beyond me as a Christian, individual Christian, into the church as a whole? Well, I will just say one thing. Uh, when Peter wrote this, was he addressing individual believers there, or was he addressing a group of Christians? Was there the idea here that Christians as a whole could grow in grace and in knowledge and in understanding, or was that simply an individualized thing? It's, it's a point to consider. Or here's another one uh, from the Upper Room Discourse, 
Jesus said to the apostles, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now, some of you may have studied the, the Gospel of John already, and you may know that there is some debate about the application of this verse. In fact, many of the verses there in the Upper Room Discourse. Was Jesus talking here just to his apostles, saying, Yes, you are the apostles I am sending out, I'm giving you a special authority. I'm going to give you a special guide. And of course, the scripture is given to us fundamentally through the apostles, either by the apostles themselves writing it, uh, if you include Paul in that number, or by those who were associated with the apostles, such as Luke traveling uh, with Paul, or uh, as the tradition goes of Mark writing his gospel based on Peter. All right, the spirit of truth guiding us, is that referring there, or does it have a broader application to the church at large? Uh, not in the Catholic sense, of course, in that the church has an, an infallible interpreting authority, but that Christians, the church as a whole, are also guided and helped by the Spirit into all truth. But this is actually a, a passage one of my students gave me once when I was lecturing on this topic. Uh, Till we all come in the unity of the faith uh, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In fact, you look at the context of Ephesians chapter 4, Paul is talking about the various uh, offices uh, given to the church, the pastor, teachers, evangelists, and so on, who are to serve uh, for the edifying, if you look at the end of verse 12, the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of faith. I think these are considerations for us to weigh, uh, muse over perhaps, Though, again, I stop short of saying that any of these exegetically teach the point I'm giving as a scriptural principle here. Now, what are the strengths of this view, this historical developmental view, this progressive illumination view that I have shared with you? What is it that makes it uh, useful? Well, one is the big point I've been saying. Uh, we've got development being explained without undermining scripture, that yes, there has been error or incomplete knowledge in history, but that the scripture always stood complete. The scripture's always been whole, uh, and that we look at this and say, well, we understand that, well, we understand that we understand better uh, now through time and so on. And I think that's the major thing. It's the major, it's, in a sense, this is the major appeal that the idea has had to me, wanting to affirm the authority of scripture without in any way diminishing it. I mention this too that I think is a strength. It deflects the charge of novelty. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the whole idea that something is new or sounds new is necessarily wrong. Now, I, I grant you that usually that somebody comes up with an idea that nobody in history ever seems to have taught before, you're a little suspicious of that with good reason. Remember, when I was in uh, graduate school and seminary, we used Charles Hodge's systematic theology. Now, I did not go to graduate school in the 19th century, uh, but we were using Hodge in part because the teacher liked that Hodge had a lot written many scripture proofs in his discussion. But in almost every doctrine that Hodge discussed, he'd go through all these different arguments and scripture passages, and the last thing, well, in most cases, he would say, and the testimony of the history of the church is that this is the historic view. And I always thought that was pretty interesting, although it's interesting he always puts it last. Uh, it's not something that's put right up front here as well. Well, the fact is, though, we, we can't just assume that because everybody seems to have taught that it's okay. Uh, Vincent of Lorraine uh, in the what, fifth century put get forth what's called the Vincentian Canon. You may have heard this sometime. That, you know, what's true doctrine? Well, Vincent said, what's been believed everywhere, always, by everyone. Well, you start thinking about that, there's some holes in that. Uh, first of all, you have to decide who is the everyone that you're getting the agreement based from as well. But the fact is that when you come to justification by faith alone, you know, you don't have a clear statement of that before Martin Luther. Now, there are considerations and ideas and thoughts you can dig in and debate and discuss. I want to mention that justification before the Reformation is a complicated topic. In fact, I talk about that in my historical theology class. But we have to admit that nobody actually put it together quite like Martin Luther did, at least since the Apostle Paul. And so there's something new there. Or here's another one that I would assume probably characterizes most of us, if not all of us in this class, the pre-tribulational rapture uh, of Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ uh, before the tribulation. Uh, you know, 
that's again a teaching you really can't find clearly or certainly systematically taught prior to really the 19th century. But the fact is, you know, are, is it still nonetheless a true teaching? Well, the question is, what does the scripture say about it? Is it biblical? And of course, if something's biblical, it doesn't matter whether you find a historical genealogy for it or not. I respect history. I use history. We can use history as a helpful guideline sometimes, but again, it's not our authority. And the fact is, if we realize that there's been a development of doctrine through history, then the fact that something may sound new does not necessarily mean it's wrong. But you go back to look at the scriptural basis for a doctrine, not the history of that doctrine through the church. Now, let me offer some cautions, though. As I tried to be say, say all along here, I'm trying to be very careful and moderate about this. Uh, one thing, as I say, this is not something. This is something I'm saying is a, a suggestion. But there are some cautions we should keep in mind. The first one is again this: it's a theory of history. And you can have all kinds of theories of history, which may or may not be true, may have some scriptural validity or not. I mean, if you go back and read St. Augustine's City of God, that was really the first Christian philosophy of history, or some would call it the first theology of history. And there's some interesting things in Augustine. There's some things in Augustine we wouldn't follow or accept here. What I'm giving you here is a theory or approach uh, that at least is a uh, perhaps somewhat help, but if nothing else, it introduces you to some of the different ideas that people have put forth before. Now, here's another point, though. Is illumination the best term, progressive illumination? A few years ago, I gave a paper on this topic at a uh, conference being held at, uh, I think it was at Central Seminary in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, and afterwards, they had uh, someone respond to the paper. If you've ever, if you've ever been to, you know, these scholarly things, quite often you'll have somebody give a response to a paper or presentation. Uh, and the one who, who responded to me was a longtime friend of mine. We were in graduate school together and basically don't have, you know, major differences. But he raised some questions. And he, he agreed with the idea that, you know, you probably can see a development through history, though how you approach and, and, and uh, verbalize that you need to question. But he questioned about the idea of illumination. I know he said, you know, for example, is illumination the best term? I mean, isn't illumination just for Christian believers? And doesn't this idea seem to apply that maybe the unregenerate were part of this process of further light being cast upon God's word? Um, he was uncertain whether there was a scriptural warrant. Now, I gave you what I thought were some scriptural considerations, but he would say, I'm not really sure that that's, that's enough, that that's sufficient, uh, that there's an exegetical basis for it as well, and so on. Now, I read, frankly, I took that criticism, and I still keep taking it to heart. Maybe progressive illumination isn't the best term for what I'm describing. You know, maybe you want to come up with something else. Should we say progressive development? Well, the only reason I stick with the illumination term, well, one is that's the way I learned it, but that's not sufficient basis by itself. It's also the fact that I do want to get the idea of God's sovereignty and God's guidance in history, that God is directing his church, uh, and I don't want to lose that Point or lose that idea as we think about the possibility of development in history. But I, re I recognize that there is a question that could be raised there. Um, and, and I acknowledge that and, and want to say, well, I'm, I'm willing to discuss that. I'm willing to discuss any of the points that I put forth here. Now, you also want to beware, okay, the Whig interpretation of history. If you don't know that term, that means when you justify your own position through using history. Okay, I, I thought about not even giving you the term Whig interpretation. It comes from an English historian named Herbert Butterfield, who, by the way, was uh, supposed to be a professing Christian. I don't know enough about details about him. But he wrote this famous work where he was talking about in English history, how there's a tendency to write, write history so that history seems to justify you. In other words, all the things that happened in history have come about so that it produces you and your ideas and your views. Now, I gave you the phrase because you might encounter that somewhere, especially if you're doing any kind of graduate level study on history and philosophy, history and so on. But that's the basic idea. Uh, there is always this danger when you start talking about a development of, well, I am the climax of development. I remember reading a book by a man who went through Bob Jones University years before I did, uh, who had Dr. Edward Panosian as a teacher in church history. 
And he heard Dr. Panosian teach this concept of progressive illumination, and he was very impressed by it. Uh, he thought, well, this may be kind of a, a key to understanding. I read a book that he wrote. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not putting this man down. I don't know him personally. He's with the Lord now. I don't know him personally, but someone who knew him said he's a very godly man, a very talented teacher. But basically, he ended up that uh, applying progressive illumination so that what you ended up with was, you know, the true view of the Trinity. Well, yes, the true view of the deity of Christ, the true view of justification by faith, the true view of Scripture the true view of church polity, the true view of prophecy and eschatology, basically what he ended up with was that what he believed was essentially the product of developmental development through history. Well, there's a point to that, but we've got to be very careful here not just to use this as, well, this is just showing that what I believe is right because that's the way history has gone. We could be humble. We also got to admit we could have made a mistake somewhere along the way as we interpreted the data, not as I'm saying here mistakes in Scripture, but are we certain that we are interpreting it rightly? That's the part of the hermeneutical application here that we want to keep in mind. Also, it's not a law of inevitable progress. I'm not saying, okay, in the early 20th century, there was a French uh, psychologist who taught his patients to say, in every day, in every way, I am getting better and better. And you're supposed to say this to yourself and convince yourself you're getting better. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not saying the church is getting better all the time. Frankly, there are things that are corruptions in the church. I mean, like I told you, I teach cults. I know there are corruptions. I study church history. I know there are corruptions. So we're not trying to deny that there are corruptions. And we're not trying to give some sort of uh, post-millennial, everything is improving a kind of approach here. We're simply saying that, well, one aspect of history, one aspect of history we should consider is that there can be a development in our understanding, but that doesn't mean that we're all getting right and we're all achieving perfection. I mean, let's face it, uh, progressive illumination, if it's a valid concept, will not be validated entirely until we reach glorification. Just as our sanctification is completed in heaven and we have then a full knowledge and understanding, so I'm afraid our full knowledge and understanding of the truth and history will also come when we are all joined to Christ as well. But I'm just saying here, I don't want to press this too far. And I don't want to say it's a, a means of forecasting the future. This is not a Christian horoscope. Uh, I sometimes have students ask me when I present this idea, well, you know, well, what are some things you think are going to happen in the next hundred years? What's going to be what we learn about and understand about? Well, historians make lousy prophets. Uh, I still remember uh, thinking back was, I guess, was it in the 80s sometime, thinking three things I would never see in my lifetime was to see Republicans control Congress again, uh, to see um, the, the Soviet Union lose control of Eastern Europe, and the Cincinnati Reds to win the World Series again. But all three have happened in my lifetime. Uh, if you don't know the Cincinnati Reds, it's the American baseball team. But the point I'm making here is uh, I don't have any talent for forecasting the future. I'm not sure what might be a development. What I'm trying to do is look back on history and say, well, here's a way we might look at and consider and weigh these things. I'm not trying to tell you this is how history is going to happen and how history is going to go. You see, we never reach the end. Some truth is inexhaustible. Uh, as long as we are humans, I mean, all of us as individual Christians are always going to have more room to grow. Even the most wonderful godly saint who reaches the end of a long life and lies on his deathbed, he still isn't there yet until he steps over into the kingdom of glory. Uh, the church is going to continue, I think, to possibly profit by this, but let's face it, we don't think of there being any debate over the Trinity now, but do any of us still really understand and comprehend all that's involved with the doctrine of the Trinity? Some truth is going to be inexhaustible to us. So this brings me back to my central point. The Bible is the judge of all doctrine and history. And therefore, uh, as we look at it, we want to make sure that we keep the Scripture in a prominent place and not allow history to displace it. I remember an expression, I've mentioned now Dr. Panosian two or three times in this lecture. Remember, he used to have an expression, he which he would talk about that sure touchstone of truth, which is the Word of God. And I thought that was a wonderfully expressed uh, uh, comment there never dawned on me for many years. I didn't know what a touchstone was. In fact, 
I was teaching a course on American frontier history. And I got to things like gold rushes and gold mining in the American West. And I found out what a touchstone was. Uh, a touchstone is a kind of uh, schist or jasper a kind of stone. And you can take it and you scrape it across an alloy you think might be gold. Well, if it's gold, it will show a particular color. And you will know that, yes, what you really have here is gold. And if the color doesn't show up, you know you don't. The sure touchstone of truth, which is the word of God, means we take the scripture and bring it over any teaching. And the scripture is going to tell us whether it is true or whether it is false. It is our guideline. It is our authority. And I hope that everything I say in your life, I hope it's been thought-provoking. I hope some points have been helpful to you. But I also want to come back to this point. Don't lose sight of the most important fact. Progressive illumination is a theory. The scripture is certainly, unquestionably, the word of God. All right, that completes my notes here, Dr. Honor. Do we have other comments or questions you want to bring out in our remaining time? Great. Um, so there was one question that came by here I wanted to ask you about. Uh, someone has asked, actually two different people asked, how do we apply this to say Catholic doctrinal development so that they could claim that the Holy Spirit did guide them to all truth? Um, and then how would we distinguish what we're doing here from what they would be doing? That's a good point. That's the same point that William Cunningham was making when he criticized Newman. Uh, that basically you go back again to the scripture. What does the Bible say about it? See, it's not just a matter of say, well, things have developed through history, so my history is as valid as your history. It's like, okay, well, let's take your history or my history and let's see what the Bible says about it. Let's, what I was just talking about, let's try taking that touchstone of truth across our approach of history. And it shows you that this is not valid here. This is, not, this is indeed contrary to what the scripture says, or the scripture validates what this has said. See, that's why I want to stress that, you know, our position is ultimately in the Bible, not in history. Uh, what I want to do is help us, because we believe in the Bible, to understand history and to be able to judge between what is false and uh, what is correct. Um, great. Yeah, here's a thing that, um, this is from myself. <laughs> so yeah. I've had sometimes the idea come by me that you can look across you can look across history and you can see a, a progression in the areas of doctrine that are getting discussed so in the early days you're hitting the fundamentals christology the trinity theology proper and then you go a little further and you're hitting reformation you're hitting soteriology and then you know it's in the last couple of hundred years that we see eschatology which it all pans out really nicely because um that puts us right at the end so that's good we're the climax but um Anyway, well, how do you, I, I say that ironically, how do you respond to that or how would you view that? I mean, is, is that a legitimate idea or is it a little bit more cyclical that we're going to see things happening in different doctrines and it's going to come back on itself and so forth? That is a good observation that I want to make an observation about, but also one caution with it. I remember, in fact, I mentioned Dr. Pinoza, he would comment on this, and perhaps Dr. Arnold, you heard this as well, that like you take, you were to take a systematic theology book and notice that it starts with, you know, in a sense, what you start with the doctrine of God, which was the, what we find in the early church, and you would go through then perhaps things like doctrines related to salvation, which is Reformation. You find eschatology at the end of the book, which is more recent. I believe, in fact, this is off the top of my head, that it was James Orr who made that observation, uh, 19th century, early 20th century uh, American theologian and writer here. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, and the fact is that you look at, you know, well, the early church, that's where we dealt with the doctrine of the Trinity and the Godhead and Christ. And the Reformation is where we dealt with soteriology and justification. You know, I tell my students sometimes the early church talks about who Jesus Christ was and the Reformation is what Jesus Christ did. Um, and then, of course, eschatology has been more of a focus in the last couple of centuries here, uh, certainly much more broad. The only thing I want to caution here is if we've got to understand, though, that it's not history which determines its importance. Uh, I mean by that, uh, why is it the Trinity is such a key doctrine? Well, it's, of course, it's fundamental to the nature of who God is and how God works and how, you know, I mean, it's just an essential. Uh, when you come to questions of eschatology, there are some questions there that are very essential. You know, for example, that Jesus Christ will come again. Or if you go back to Reformation eschatology, that there is no such place as purgatory. Uh, for example, but we have to be more cautious or careful because if you don't believe right on the Trinity, 
if you don't believe right on the deity of Christ and his resurrection, then I just can't conceive of how such a person could be saved. But if you want to believe in, I'm a premillennialist, but if you want to be an amillennialist or a postmillennialist, that is not a gospel-related question. So the historical development pattern there, I think, is a good observation. We've got to realize, though, that we can't get in the mind way of thinking, well, we've now come to the true idea on eschatology. The scripture waits for us, I mean, or gives weight to how important a doctrine or teaching is by how it relates to the gospel. And so we got to make sure that something's important because the Bible says it's important, not because we say we have now discussed that question. Is that answer? Yeah, that makes sense. No, that makes sense. You know, I mean, you do see, um, I, so just within the, the short period of my theological consciousness, so we've hit open theism, and then this recent little thing that happened uh, maybe a year and a half ago with the eternal uh, eternal subordination of the sun mm -hmm. you know some of these things come up and you you're looking at it and thinking wow this is this is uh back to theology proper and there's some really fundamental things at play here yes um i don't know that either one of those is really going to make the books on on the long term that we're going to somehow you know feed those into this represents the 21st century and theology or something probably both of them are going to be forgotten but yeah, anyway, you can still see some cyclical things coming back around, even while, while there's a macro pattern. Very interesting. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, in fact, like you mentioned this thing over the subordination of the sun. I mean, you're actually going back to the original Trinitarian and Christological arguments again and bringing those up and what was going on there. So in a sense, there's this constant discussion going on, even on questions we feel are pretty much settled, that sometimes the debate's going to reappear sometimes. And, and a piece that came out of that. Um, so, like, how are we understanding eternal generation of the sun? <laughs> That's really old. Yeah. Um, and then how to understand these terms that are associated and so forth. These are, these are very old questions. But here they come back around again. Um, okay, I'm just looking across, and I'm not seeing another question here. There was something that you said in passing <laughs> earlier, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you, in passing, you said, um, we don't have time to comment on this. And I remember thinking, oh, I really wish we had the time. Uh, if just, you recall what that was. Is it just my faith? Uh, yes, it was. Yes. Okay. So how we view that in respect to, you know, Martin Luther being the first person to articulate it that way. Right. Do you want to comment on that area? Or? Well, I'll give you a couple of quick comments about it. You know, one of the, this is the classic, in fact, it fits in with our topic because it's the classic illustration. Well, nobody taught justification by faith alone until Martin Luther came along. Therefore, it must be wrong. Uh, well, when you start looking at the question, uh, you first of all have to keep this in mind. There are some things about the way Martin Luther systematized it, stated it, and summarized it, which were fundamentally new. But to understand, though, uh, as one writer pointed out, if you go to the Council of Trent, which, of course, is the Catholic response to the Protestant Reformation, and you look at them on justification, what they were saying there, too, was really new and innovative as well, because as they were responding to Protestants, they changed their language and their emphasis somewhat, so that, yeah, it was kind of new, too. And then you can go back to specific things. You can find references in church history, kind of intriguing ones. You go back to the earliest church fathers, and some of them are talking about, you know, justification by faith. Now, what did they mean? What are these passages verbatim? I mean, even Origen, we think of as being one of the really heretical fathers, you know, Origen actually taught that the thief on the cross was justified by faith alone. He said he didn't have time to do any works. He couldn't be baptized. He was saved solely on the basis of his faith in Jesus Christ. Well, so you can find these interesting examples and points. There's a similar passage to that in John Chrysostom talking about the thief on the cross. It's like Catholics would say, well, maybe the thief on the cross can be justified by faith alone, but nobody else can. I'm not sure <laughs> what they would do with it. But you have that it's kind of like the different parts and components of what we talk about in justification. You can find anticipation. You can find hints at it. Uh, but it all comes together with Martin Luther. And by the way, I might just mention this. Pre-tribulation to me is the same thing. And you, may, you really can't find it that clearly you know, earlier in history. But what you have in the 19th century is an organization and a systematizing of ideas that had been around before. Uh, so even though it's somewhat new to our way of thinking, not all the components of it are new either. So there is a historical aspect even there. Does that help? Very much. That's great. Um, I was, <laughs> it was ironic when you mentioned, uh, so a, a premillennial 
interpretation within eschatology, because that was one of the question, questions I wanted to ask you. I've, I've hit different um, readings in the Fathers that you see some things that sound premillennial-ish, and then you come to other things that are different. Um, so yeah, what would be your read on the Fathers, or I'm putting you on the spot again, yeah. what would your, be re your read on the Fathers? Is there I guess the conclusion I came to that there's a preset or kind of a direction that's more what we would recognize, recognize as premillennialism. Yeah. So of course they're not doing it the way we do it. Right. Actually, the way you put it there at the end is pretty close to it. The usual, the usual uh, summary of this is that the early church was premillennial uh, and then amillennialism developed. Usually you'll see Origen and especially then Augustine character, uh, 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 given the credit, I guess you would say, for developing and, and promoting amillennialism. And then postmillennialism itself was a post-Reformation thing. Uh, it wasn't invented by Jonathan Edwards, but he's the one credited with popularizing that. But yeah, the, the evidence seems to be pretty much the early church was premillennial, but it was not a unified premillennial system. It was not a systematic, you know, you have a lot of different people talking about the, the last times in premillennial terms, we don't know if they were necessarily coming at it with exactly the same interpretation. Now, there are some who argue that, that even back in the early days, there was some dissent. Uh, but I remember Dr. David Beal, my other major church history professor, uh, he did his dissertation on eschatology among the anti-Nicene fathers, the fathers before the, before the Council of Nicaea. And he came, you know, there are some generalizations we can make, generally premillennial, uh, some aspects that seem to be generally agreed upon, but not really a systematic, full-blown system, uh, systematic system, not a full-blown uh, premillennial theology that came out of it here, a tendency that, all, that most of them reflected in different ways. Great. Got it. Um, okay, if someone else has a question, this is your last shot. <laughs> so, Dr. Sidwell, thank you. This has been very helpful. My uh, my fingers are thankful for the rest now. I've been just trying to get things down. And, but it's very enjoyable and very helpful. Um, and thank you for putting the time and effort into this. Well, I have enjoyed doing it and enjoyed sharing this with, and I, like I say, it's something for you to think about, not something for you to accept without qualification or question. As you keep studying church history, keep these thoughts in mind. See, maybe you want to come up sometime and do your own modified version of this where you can correct some of the things that I've gotten wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very thought provoking, very thought provoking things. So uh, let me just leave us all with a challenge as far as our next time coming in. You mentioned earlier, of course, uh, landmarkism, successionism. Dr. Cook will be with us on uh, Monday and he'll be talking us through his dissertation, which was specifically on this topic. The readings that you have in the Dropbox folder uh, from his dissertation, very good stuff. And it will very much illustrate uh, a, a, a wrong direction that Dr. Sidwell talked about tonight. So you'll see this actually played out right there. And then um, Dr. Cook will be walking us through how to evaluate and respond accordingly. So that's it for tonight. Thank you all. Dr. Sidwell, big thank you again. Thank Looking you for forward me. to seeing everyone else. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Good night.